our King this morning. Let's give him praise. gift to you, our King, who's worthy. We sing with gratitude this morning. And all my words fall short, and I've got nothing new. How could I express?
Church, I think not often enough do we think about our singing and our worship of the Lord to be a gift for Him. It's something that God like desires from His kids. Like He wants us to lift high the name of Jesus. He wants us to sing these songs of gratitude to Him. This is a gift that we get to bring to Him. It's a beautiful gift of us singing. Just a quick side note, how like inconvenient was the gift of a little drummer boy going like for Mary? I'm just, I always thought about that. Like she just got Jesus to sleep and here comes a kid with a drum. He's like, no offense, Martin, sorry. But like, that's just so inconvenient. But anyway, I was just thinking about this gift that we get to bring to our Father, to our God in heaven, the creator of the universe. We get to sing this to him today. So let's not let this moment pass by where we don't bring this gift to our God who's worthy this morning. So we're gonna sing this again and we're gonna sing it at the top of our lungs because he's worthy and God, you deserve this gift, come on. So I throw up my head. So Except for our singing, hallelujah. 
God, we sing these songs for you, our King who's worthy. God, thank you. Thank you so much for the price that you paid for us. Thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. And what a privilege it is to sing with friends and family. What an honor it is to bring this gift of song to you, our King. You are so worthy. God, I pray that throughout the rest of this holiday season, we would focus our attention on you and you alone, God. God, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Well, welcome. We are grateful you're here at Austin Ridge Bible Church this morning to celebrate this Advent season that we are in. My name is Joey Ryder, one of the pastors here uh, at the Ridge, and we just have a couple announcements for you. Uh, the main thing is this, is we want to help you connect beyond Sunday morning. And so in the seat between you, uh, there's a QR code. We'd love for you to scan that, and there's some information about things that are going on here at the church. You can also stop by our Connect Desk on the way out. There's one on the balcony and then one uh, here on the main level on the way out. Just talk to somebody, fill out a connect card. Uh, love for to connect with you and help you connect beyond uh, Sunday morning. Well, Christmas season is upon us, and so we've got a lot of happenings. As you saw on the way in, there's some things happening out there on the lawn. Uh, we also have uh, Christmas at the Ridge uh, ornaments that are on sale in the lobby, and so I encourage you to pick one of these up. They're really, really cool. And uh, you can attach maybe a, a one of these uh, with our invite cards. So also on your way out, these don't cost you anything. Uh, you can pick these up, and we would encourage you to invite your friends to one of our five Christmas Eve services that we have here uh, at the Ridge. And so um, we would uh, encourage you to invite your neighbors and your coworkers and, and prayerfully consider uh, handing these to somebody to invite them uh, to celebrate Christmas with us. If you have any questions about timing or anything like that for Christmas, you can go to austinridge.org slash Christmas and find out all the details there. Uh, I know it's kind of weird thinking about January because we still have to get past Christmas, um, but we want to invite you out uh, in January. I feel that guy's pain. Um, we want to invite you out to uh, our equip ministry, our equip classroom environment. Uh, we have two classes that are coming up in the new year that we think will be very helpful. Uh, one is Intro to Christianity, and uh, it's a one-day class at 9 a.m on January 14th, and it's just for those people who are just kind of kicking the tires on church and Christianity. So if you know somebody like that, invite them to that. Uh, the other one is called Story of Scripture. We've got this Wednesday night classroom environment. It's sort of like seminary light. Uh, we would encourage you to come out. Story of Scripture is an overview of the story of the Bible, and so uh, we invite you to come out to that. And uh, any other information you'd like about our equip ministry, you can go to austinridge.org slash Equip. Finally, this morning, uh, as you consider where you might give for your end of year giving, we would encourage you to, to give to Austin Ridge Bible Church. There's a works happening all around the globe uh, with gospel advancement happening because of what is given uh, to this church. And so uh, we would ask you to consider that and go to austinridge.org uh, slash, uh, slash EOY as you consider that. Let's prepare our hearts now as we get ready for our Advent reading this morning. On this third Sunday of Advent, we celebrate the joy we have in Christ. Luke 2, 8 through 14 says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you the good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel of a multitude and heavenly host praising, the, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on the peace among these with whom he is pleased. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Fill our hearts with joy. Help us to pay attention and listen like the shepherds. 
We praise you that you announced your birth first to the humble shepherds in the field. Forgive us when we become, we become distracted. Remind us that you are good. And thank you for the joy you give us and the joy that is yet to come. Kingdoms aren't inherited, they're won through conquest, fear, the sharp edge of a blade, a willingness to do whatever is necessary to hold these borders by the might of your own hand and then push outward, to expand and conquer the land and every home in it, to subdue the spirit of those who might resist what is inevitable. The game of empires is not for the weak. There is no room for the peacemakers. The pure in heart will be defiled. The poor will be subjugated, and only in their submission to the state will they be allowed to live, taxed for the privilege to serve the kingdom that conquered them. I sit upon the throne of an eternal kingdom. Who dares try and take it from me? Who is willing to die at the hands of the Empire? Good morning, Austin Ridge. Is it too early to say Merry Christmas? No. All right, Merry Christmas to you. And uh, we are so glad that you're here today. I need your help though, okay? I need you to fill in the blank on these songs. Here we go, first one, joy to the world, let earth receive her king. king. All right, good, good. Next one. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. All right, y'all are doing way better than nine o'clock. I think y'all seem a lot more caffeinated too. <laughs> then uh, Noel, 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 born is the king. Okay. You're a mean one, mister. I heard some kings there, wow. <laughs> Uh, a lot of our Christmas songs, they talk about Jesus being king. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I don't know about you, I love this time of the year. I love walking in the stores and hearing songs of Jesus being king. And it's very nostalgic to me. I mean, most of these songs I've heard since I was a child. It is warm and it's comfortable. For me, it's not Christmas season until I hear Nat King Cole sing Silent Night. That's just part of it for me. Um, but you know, really the truth behind those songs is almost the opposite of what we look at as a Christmas carol. These songs are a declaration of war. It is Christ invading his fallen and broken creation to say, I am the king of all, I am the Lord of all. And so Bethlehem is more like Normandy. Uh, these songs are more like battle hymns declaring that Jesus is the true king. Well, we're in the middle of a series, our Advent series, as we're looking forward to the day we celebrate Christ's birth, and we are looking at the Christmas story through the eyes of several characters. And so we looked at Mary and her perspective week one. Week two, we looked at the shepherds and their perspective, and I drew the short straw. We're talking about King Herod today and uh, the villain of the Christmas story. And uh, King Herod is a man that, uh, I, I think that the Bible is telling us his story in the book of Matthew for a very specific reason. His story is found in Matthew 2, you can turn there if you'd like, but before we get there, Matthew lays a foundation. It, Matthew 1 wants us to look at Matthew 2 from a certain lens. And um, so really, Matthew 1 is the introduction to the story of Jesus. It's the build up to the story of Jesus. If you're like me, this year I've really enjoyed watching Longhorns football, and uh, before you turn the game on, they give you that hype video, right? And man, they get you all pumped up about the Longhorns, and when that video's done, you're ready to run on the field yourself or find a Washington fan and TP their yard or something like that. I mean, it's, it gets you all pumped up, ready to do something. And that's what Matthew 1 is. It's the hype song for the rest of Matthew. Now, if you and I were to get together and I said, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself, and you started off by saying, well, let me go back to my great, great, great grandfather and tell you about him. 
That would not be a great conversation, right? That would not be a great buildup. But that's exactly what Matthew does. Before Matthew introduces us to Jesus, we have in Matthew chapter one, a lineage of Jesus, all of Jesus' descendants. And to you and me, that seems really, really boring. But to the original audience, this was really exciting. So we're going to read from Matthew one just a little bit. Verse number one, the book of the genealogies of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Both David and Abraham are Old Testament figures who are in Jesus's lineage. Abraham is usually the one who's more highly honored because he's the father of the Hebrew race. His, the word Hebrew comes from Abraham's name and he's usually the one that you'd see first. But this story of Jesus, this genealogy of Jesus is emphasizing David for some reason. David is the first name. And you go through and you have oh, about 42 generations of people leading up to Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, and then to Jesus himself. And in this lineage, you find it's the lineage of David. There are 14 kings mentioned in this genealogy, but only one is called a king, and that is King David. In fact, as I go through this chapter, the name that I read more than any other name is King David over and over again, David, 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 David. And so when we are reading Matthew 1, about to go to Matthew 2, there are two things that we are intended to think about. Number one, we're to think about this King David, who was Israel's greatest king, and who was promised the fact that he would have a descendant who would be even greater than he was. Now this descendant would be the promised one, the Messiah, and he would establish a kingdom that would never, ever end. So when the intended audience is reading Matthew chapter one, what they're thinking is, wow, this is exciting because we know that there's this promised king coming and currently they are living in, in a captivity of sorts. They're living under Roman rule. And so this idea of a king who would establish an everlasting kingdom is really exciting. But there's also a little bit of interpretation, I can't say it, a little bit of consternation uh, because the fact that the kings had fallen so much. You see, David and his descendants, uh, although David was a great king, those that followed him were not such great kings. They made poor decisions and they rebelled against God and in their rebellion, the people that followed them rebelled against God as well. To the point to where God actually has another kingdom come in and conquer Israel. And so as they're, as they're reading these genealogies and thinking about how this leads up to Jesus, it's the, the joyful anticipation of a great king, but wow, there are a whole lot of kings that have let us down in the past. And then that brings us to Herod's story in Matthew chapter two. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now this is really great because in two verses, the author takes all of these kingly ideas and pits them against each other. This is the clash of kings. We read of Jesus, whose genealogy we just read. He is the heir apparent of King David. We read of Bethlehem, the city of kings, where David was born. We read of Herod the king. We read of the wise men who bring kingly gifts, and they go to Herod saying, where is the king of the Jews? Now, to add something to this, just to give us a little context about King Herod, at this point, King Herod had reigned for a, quite a long time. He was at the end of his life. In fact, probably he would die within months of this story ending in Matthew chapter number two. And Herod was known for two things. Number one, he was extremely violent. If anyone opposed him, he would destroy them. He would kill them, probably kill their family. He might even kill people who looked like them. That's kind of how King Herod worked. Uh, but, you know, he had to keep the peace. And so when he would do these violent things, he found it helpful to do something to win favor from the people. He had all these amazing construction projects that he would complete. And many of them still stand today in the land of Israel. Um, even and probably the most well known is the temple. He expanded the temple to its largest size, part of the temple wall, you can still see today, Herod is the one who did that. But here's something that's really interesting. If you rewind a little bit before this story, about 35 years earlier, Herod's a young man. Israel this time is not under Roman rule. It's kind of going through this inner mission kind of a time and there's no direct rule over Israel. Herod goes to Rome and he negotiates a deal with the Roman Senate 
that he will lead the armies of Rome to conquer the land of Israel and to rule as a puppet king under the Roman Empire. And the Senate likes that idea and they give him a title. He's called the King of the Jews. That's what the Roman Senate give to Herod. So you can imagine what Herod's thinking when all of a sudden these, these wise men from the east come and say, hey, we're looking for the king of the Jews, and Herod's about to raise his hand. They say, no, no, we're talking about the one that's born now. Herod is a little bit concerned about that. We read on in verse number three, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. This is a threat to Herod. He, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So Herod is troubled, and when Herod is troubled, the people around him are troubled because somebody's probably about to die. And this was just common practice for Herod. Herod killed a lot of people. He killed his wife. He murdered his wife's brother. He murdered two of his sons. He murdered his grandfather. He murdered his mother-in-law. I have thoughts about that. My mother-in-law's with me today. Um, <laughs> we're gonna keep moving though. Uh, it was said of Herod that it was safer to be Herod's sow, his female pig. It's safer to be Herod's sow than his son because Herod would even see his own family as threats and would murder them. So when he is troubled, all of Jerusalem's troubled. Why? Because Herod's about to do something. Now, just to kind of think through this a minute, I don't think that Herod was really thinking that there was a child that would be born and grow up and one day usurp him. He is at the end of his life. He's not gonna survive long enough for a child to come of age and do that. I think what Herod is concerned about is he doesn't want anybody to have any inkling of hope that there might be any other power or any other king besides Herod himself. And so he very actively wants to stop that right now. And so Herod, uh, he calls the people who might know about this prophecy, this idea of a star and this new king of the Jews. And he, this is what he finds out in verse number five. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, this is quoting from Micah, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now we're only given like a little snippet of this longer passage in Micah. Most likely, Herod was familiar with the whole passage because you know then you didn't have chapter and verse divisions. You had a big long scroll and this was probably part of a the Minor Prophets, a 13 book scroll, and so you kinda had to dig through it and find the passage and read, and, and if you read that whole section, it's a really interesting section because it talks about a king of righteousness who will be born in Bethlehem, and he will overthrow all other evil kings and all oppression and injustice and, and greedy kings, and, and, and that he will be victorious for the people of God. And can you imagine like Herod's like listening to this about this king has come and overthrow all these unrighteous kings and he's kind of like feeling called out a little bit, right? And he's like, oh, evil kings. Yeah, I don't know any kings like that, but if, if there were kings like that, they would be really, really concerned about this prophecy. I'm not that guy though. Uh, but Herod does respond in verse seven. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So Herod comes up with a scheme and the scheme is to deceive the wise men saying, you guys, you seem to know what you're doing. Find out where he is and let me know because I really want to worship him. We know that's not Herod's intent. This mighty king, this powerful king, he's going to destroy the real king. And as powerful as he was, we see that God thwarts his plan completely with a series of three dreams. In other words, it's almost like God doesn't even have to try hard to thwart the plans of Herod. But Herod is deceived by the wise men and, of course, the child Jesus is saved. But then it brings us to verse 16, and this is the sad tragedy of the Christmas story. This is the heartbreak of the Christmas story. Then Herod, when he, had seen, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. We know what happens when Herod becomes furious. 
and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, and we'll read this prophecy in a minute. But Herod comes in to Bethlehem, grabs children, innocent babies, two years and below, and murders them without mercy. This is one of the most awful things we read of in Scripture, a horrific story. You can't hardly imagine anything more evil, more diabolical than this happening in the story. And the writer brings in this prophecy and brings in the prophecy for two reasons. One reason to say, hey, all this is actually not stopping God's plan. God's plan will be accomplished in spite of it. But there's also a practical reason. The prophecy is this, it's quoting from Jeremiah 31. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel, that would be the matriarch of Israel. Rachel, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So if you go back and you read through Jeremiah 31, what you'll find is that it's actually a really positive section of the prophets. The Old Testament prophets, you ever read those and you're thinking, man, I, I am kind of depressed reading this. There's a lot of doom and gloom and bad things happening. Well, Jeremiah 31 is kind of the opposite of that. Jeremiah is saying, listen, you have broken your covenant with God and is bringing in all this destruction, but there's coming a day where God is going to give you a new covenant. And in this new covenant, it's not going to be this covenant based on you obeying the law, but God will write his law in your heart. And no one's going to have to tell you to worship and obey God. You're going to have that in your heart and you will know him for yourself. And it literally talks about like dancing in the streets and great joy. And right in the middle of this passage, it has this little like two or three verse interlude where it says, oh, and by the way, let's give you a prophecy about babies being, bur being uh, murdered down the road. It's like, whoa, sharp contrast, right? It's like positive, everything's great. And oh, by the way, um, babies will be killed. And then it goes on and it says this, it says, rejoice, there is hope for your future. And so it gives not just this idea that, hey, this is part of God's plan that, yes, evil people will do evil things, but people who know the true king and what the greater story of God's plan is and know what the true king is going to do, those people can have hope in the midst of extreme, extreme tragedy. And I want us just to think about that in a moment because we, we live in a day and age where the spirit of Herod is still alive. The spirit of those who they resist the authority of King Jesus. Those who stand against what Christ is and who he is. You see, Jesus' coming draws a line in the sand for every person. And every person chooses to bow before the true king or follow some kind of fake king. The spirit of Herod, if you will. And that spirit's here. You can turn on your TV and you see it. You can read the news and you see it. You see it all around us. But I want us to recognize how people who know the true king are to respond in the face of these false Herods today. Because what we read in Jeremiah 31 is not, hey, Herod's going to do bad things, and so make sure you're really angry at Herod. Make sure you're, you're discouraged because of what Herod is and what he does. No, on the other side, it says this. It says, for us to be filled with hope because there's another king who's gonna sit on the throne. And boy, I think that's important for us to think about today because I don't know about you, I could, I could spend five minutes watching the news and see Herod all over the place. The spirit of Herod is alive. And that can bring me down and that can discourage me. But what I need to do is get my eyes on the true king. Because I have reason to hope, not because Herod is going to be reformed to become a better Herod. Some of us, that's what we're thinking. We're thinking Herod's not gonna be Herod anymore. No, Herod's gonna do Herod things. But we have a greater Herod, his name is Jesus. And that's why we have hope. And I just wanna remind you who this king was, right? He wasn't just born in Matthew chapter number two. He lived a kingly life demonstrating that he was everything that the Old Testament promised he would be. He is the line of David who would establish a kingdom that had no end. He would declare that he was ushering in the kingdom of God. And as he did that, he would do miracles to show the undoing of sin's curse. In just a few chapters after this chapter, he would 
understand and say, this is how it's like to live in my kingdom and give the Sermon of the Mount of what his subjects live like and look like and think like, he would be arrested being called the, because he called himself the king of the Jews. That's what Pilate would ask him is, are you truly the king of the Jews? They put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a rod in his hand and called it a scepter. They put a purple kingly robe on his back. They mocked him, they beat him, they nailed him to a tree, and what's the sign they put on top of him? The king of the Jews. Jesus' whole life was showing that he is the true king. And then he died and was buried and rose, not just as the king of the Jews, but the king of all. That's our king, folks. That's the one that we focus on. And if you're focusing on Herod and you're upset about Herod, I understand why you're discouraged. But today, I just wanna tell you, there's someone else you can focus on today. There's someone else who can be your glory today. This is how we know we're okay, because Jesus is still on the throne. There are people here today that you have cancer, but you have hope. There are people here today, you have loss in your life, but you still have hope. There are people here today, you're going through financial reversal and you still have hope. And let me tell you why you do. It's not because your life is easy. It's not because Herod is not doing Herod type things. It's because you have found the real king. And as we find that real king, we do have hope. So what this passage teaches us is that we, when, we're, when we're faced with these Herods without, we can have hope. We can have hope in the face of the Herod without. But that's not the real Herod I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the Herod within. Because you see, we all have this heart that's like our father, Adam. Rather than living in the garden under God's rule, we'd prefer to eat the fruit of good and evil ourselves. Decide for ourselves what's good and evil and not live under obedience to the Lord Jesus. And we can try to follow Jesus the best we can, but even the best of us, we have that little part of our heart that just doesn't really love being in subjection to Jesus. Now, we might tell ourselves that's the case, but the truth is it's a struggle for every single person. And that's the Herod we want to talk about, the Herod within. And and just to think through this for a moment, a few chapters later, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about the outward behavior. For example, he talks about adultery, but he says that adultery is not the line. He says, if you commit lust in your heart, that's the line. Your heart posture is what produces the adultery. And so what we're really talking about is our heart postures today. I don't want you to think about actions and behavior. That's important, but that all comes from our heart posture. And when our hearts are not postured in a way where Jesus is exalted and he is the chief king and ruler of our life, then the result is sin and brokenness. That's how our hearts work. And so what we want to do, if we want to be faithful to King Jesus, is we have to actively and constantly patrol our hearts for anything that we manufacture that may want to dethrone Jesus functionally in our life. That's what temptation is. Temptation are things that come in our heart that want to displace Jesus as our true king. So uh, I grew up in Northwest Indiana, and if you've ever been there, uh, it's a snowy area and it's a flat area. In fact, it's so flat there that when it snowed, you didn't have any hills to sled on. We would go to, literally we'd sled off of the interstate ramps, like off the side of them, that's the only place you could sled. But every year, uh, our school, we had a parking lot right next to our playground, And when I was in elementary school, they would plow all the snow, like right next to the playground. And as the winter went on, the snow pile would get bigger and bigger. And we'd go out for recess and we'd play King of the Mountain. You ever play King of the Mountain? It's probably banned now, I don't know. (laughs) But if you're not familiar, the way it works is that you would stand on, you'd have a bunch of people who would all be fighting to be on top of the mountain. And you would push and kick and whatever you had to do to be the only one standing on top of the mountain. And as soon as you got on top of the mountain, guess what? Everybody's gunning for you to get you off the mountain and put themselves there. Well, we'd play this all the time. And uh, I remember specifically when I was in fifth grade that we were playing and the sixth graders were out at recess. And we made this variation where you'd have the king and then the king would get a bodyguard, okay? (laughs) And there is this sixth grader And when you're in fifth grade, sixth graders, they seem like not even human anyway. We're mere mortals, they're sixth graders. But there's one sixth grader named David who between his fifth and sixth grade year, he had a growth spurt and he was over six feet tall. Yeah, a giant. And I picked David as my bodyguard. 
Never in my life have I been as secure as standing on top of that mountain with David pushing people all over the place. Like people were scattering here and there, and I'm just the king of the mountain. It was good. That was basically the peak of my life right there. <laughs> but you know, that's what it means to walk with Jesus daily. That's what it means to grow in our faith. It's us putting Jesus on the mountain and say, okay, I'm here. And I know that my heart produces these false kings that want to kick him off the throne, and I want to do my best to push them off. I want to get in God's word so I recognize where these false kings are and keep Jesus, number one, at the throne of my life. I want him to be my greatest desire. I want his glory to be my chief end. I want him to be exalted in everything I do, and that is not our default position. That is something that only happens through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and as we yield to him. But that's what it means to follow Jesus. It's casting down any Herod that, con that confronts Jesus. So remember at the beginning where I asked you some questions and you did really good about saying king for all the answers? Well, I've got some more questions for you and these are not the fun kind. These are questions I ask myself to think about whether Jesus is truly on the throne of my life or not. And I want you to ask these to yourself as well. How is Jesus' rule in my life changing me now? How is Jesus' rule in my life changing me now? Because if all Jesus has to say to me is what I have to say to me, then Jesus is the king of my life, I'm the king of my life. Right, the, the whole fact that there's someone who reigns over me means that there are times that I want to go right and he tells me to go left. That's what it means to have someone reigning over us, is that there are times that things are different because of that authority over us. And so my question is, let's just say in the last two weeks, how is Jesus pointing you left when you wanted it to go right? How is he changing you? So this summer we had the drought, and at the beginning of the summer I was watering my grass multiple times of the week. And then we got the notice saying, hey, you can't water your grass multiple times a week, you can water your grass one day a week. And then we got a notice later on this summer saying, you can only water your grass one day a week and it has to be before 8 a.m. and after 10 p.m. Now, I found myself watering my grass on, on Mondays before eight o'clock and you know why? It wasn't because I thought of that myself, it's because I had some municipality reigning over me saying this is how you do it. So my behavior changed because of something ruling over me. My, what I did change because of that, and the question is this, how are you changing now because of someone who reigns over you? How is King Jesus changing your life? I'm not asking how he changed your life 20 years ago or 30 years ago when you first met him. I'm asking about his kingship today in our lives, and is he molding and changing us at this moment? Okay, I got another question too, this one's not as bad. Are you will, um, are you, what are you will, for what are you willing to disobey Jesus in order to get or protect? For what are you willing and what am I willing to disobey Jesus for to get? And for a lot of us, it's comfort. For a lot of us, it's our reputation. For a lot of us, it's, it's possessions. We will do all these things. We, we will even disobey Christ so that others think highly of us, we'll be quiet in our witness because we don't want to be labeled as that guy on the job, and on and on it goes. This idea, this, this thing of I need to protect this and I'm willing to disobey Jesus to do so. Here's the third question. What things cause us to react strongly or even sinfully when they're threatened? And we have our picture of what our life should be, what we deserve, what we're owed, and when it doesn't measure up, we are off our game, we react strongly, we try to control the situation, or we're angry because we can't control the situation. We have to ask ourselves, has that displaced Jesus as the functional king of our life? You know, as I was digging through the story of Herod, something really interesting came out. The Herod, he dies a few months after this story, most likely, and he's buried in kind of a small tomb, it seems, we don't know for sure, but it seems that he's buried in the smallest tomb outside Jerusalem that is about three miles from Bethlehem. I guess close, right? Three miles is not far away at all. And that means that that little stretch of Bethlehem hill country, that it's the place where the true king was born and the false king was put to death. And I think that's just a 
wonderful picture of what it means to walk with Jesus. Walking with Jesus means every day I'm putting the false king into the sepulcher, I'm burying him so that the new king and the true king, King Jesus, can reign in his place. That's what our role is as believers. So the story is a story that reminds us to have hope in spite of the king without, the Herod without. It's a story that reminds us to confront the Herod within. But there's another Herod I wanna talk about, and that's the Herod that could have been, the Herod that's not in this story. You know, really, we can get halfway through this story, and it's a pretty good story of Herod. It's a story of Herod hearing the news, finding out about the news, and saying, hey, lead me to the king. We know now that that was not his intention at all. His intention was not to bow before Jesus, but to murder Jesus. But what if the story was different? What if Herod, instead of resisting King Jesus, he believed in Jesus as a king. Like this is what I picture, you know, you have those nativity scenes, you know, you have baby Jesus, you have Joseph, you have Mary, you have the camels, you have the shepherds, you have the wise men, which weren't really there anyway at his birth. And wouldn't it be cool if you had King Herod there too? And he's bowing before the true king. I think that's the Herod that could have been because there's something about the story that's always puzzled me. We read about a star that attracts the attention of wise men from the east. They come and the star doesn't lead them to Bethlehem, it leads them where? It leads them to Jerusalem, where King Herod is. And then after talking to Herod, they say that they leave the city and then the star is in front of them. Well, to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, you're turned to the south. The star that was originally in the east sky is now in the south sky. And it says it leads them to the very place where Jesus is. So if God has the ability to move stars in such a way and to show the wise men leaving Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus is, isn't God big enough to have just done that from the beginning? Why do we have this pit stop in Jerusalem? And there's only one thing I can come up with and that's God's grace. God's grace. Because Herod had lived a very wicked life. He had blood on his hands. He was a man at this point, he's diseased, he's about to die, probably dying of gangrene. And yet, God was pursuing him by allowing him to be one of the few people at that day and that time to know that the true king had come. And just to think of the heart of God, it's not just like God like sent a messenger to him. God moved stars to get wise men in his audience who knew the truth. The heart of our God is moving heaven and earth for people to know who the true king is. And the Herod that could have been is the Herod that was the precursor of that final day when we stand before Jesus and every knee bows before him, and every tongue confesses that he is truly the Lord of all, he is the king of all. Herod could have started that. Herod could have been a precursor to that. When he was exposed to the truth of Jesus, he could have softened his heart, but he wasn't that. He was a New Testament Pharaoh who hardened his heart again and again, and it leads to atrocities. That was his story. The Herod that could have been though. And I wonder who here, you think you're here by accident, you think you're here because somebody invited you, you think you're here because it's just your tradition, go to church during the Advent season. But if you were really to pay attention, you would see that you're here because God's pursuing you. The heart of God to move heaven and earth so that you know his son and see him as the king of all and the Lord of all. And that's our heart for every person here is that you know Jesus. I don't mean just know about him, I don't mean no facts about him, but you truly have him functioning as the Lord of your life, he's on the throne of your life. And we try to make that as easy and as simple as we can. We, we have people afterwards who stand here to pray with you if you are somebody who wants to follow Jesus and just need some guidance. We have, we have QRs by every single seat here where you can scan them at any time and click on a connect card and say, I want to start a relationship with Jesus. We have people at desks in the lobby. You can talk to and just say, hey, I, I just want to follow Jesus. You don't even have to say the words right, but they'll know what you're talking about and they'll put you with the right person, but that's what matters. The hair that could have been. There's nothing more 
Christmas, of what the essence of Christmas is, the foundation of Christmas. There's nothing more of that than for people who know who Jesus is to bow before him in a manger and declare he is the one who deserves all the glory. Don't be discouraged because of Herod. Jesus is not sweating Herod in this world. Have hope. Don't be okay with the Herod inside your heart. Confront him and overthrow him so Jesus can reign. And all of us, let's bow before King Jesus and make him our king. Father, we are so grateful that you and your goodness did not just leave this world as it is, but you have given us a true king, your son, Jesus. And God, if we are really honest, we so many times get caught up in our daily lives. We have other th desires that rule us, and we forget that we have a king who's worth following. And I pray that you help each and every one of us today to enthrone Jesus on our heart to see him as he really is, to see the incredible gift you've given us. Father, may we truly declare that Christ is the Lord. May we praise his name forever and may his power and his glory be declared forevermore.
that he gave us his son so that we have reason to celebrate this season. Thank you all for joining us today. We're so glad that you chose Austin Ridge to worship with us today. And we're going to have prayer partners down at the front. If you need prayer, please come down. And we have lots of people out at the Connections desk who would be happy to answer any questions you may have about getting plugged in here at the church. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas.